Uh, let's go ahead and uh, everybody, let's do this uh, last chapter. And uh, believe it or not, we're finally here at the uh, last chapter. Uh, there's one more very important piece of physics discovered by a guy named uh, Maxwell. And this also is a chapter that kind of summarizes the whole semester as we uh, wrap up the end. So I put the title on the board. It's called Electromagnetic Waves. Uh, you'll see why it's titled that uh, real soon here. But uh, let's look at the first section of the book. And the first section of the book and the new piece of physics is referred to as displacement current. Now, personally, I don't really like that name displacement current uh, for two reasons. Uh, number one, the word displacement doesn't mean the same thing today as it did back in Maxwell's time. So but let me just begin by maybe in your mind replacing the word displacement with missing. So today's language, we would say that I, hey, I set down my phone somewhere and I'm missing it. I can't find my phone. It's missing. A uh, hundred plus years ago, you would have said uh, something like, I displaced my phone. Actually, the phone didn't exist then, so I guess it wouldn't have been a phone. But hopefully you see this idea, because here is Maxwell's great discovery. Here is the last piece of electromagnetics. He was looking at this. So let's take a circuit that you're familiar with. And so let me take just a uh, battery, a voltage of V and maybe a resistor of R, and then connected to a capacitor of C, and then of course hooked through a switch S. And so this is our standard RC circuit. And as he kind of analyzed this a little bit closer, he began to say, well, now let's look at Ampere's law. Uh, Ampere's law, maybe I'll rewrite it here, says if you integrate the magnetic field along a path, and usually when we do a wire, this path is a, a loop around the wire, it should equal to mu naught over uh, mu naught times the current that goes inside of this closed loop that you made. Uh, in other words, let me stay away from the capacitor for just a second. If I did an Ampian loop that was, say, right here near the resistor, I guess it would look something like this. And of course, what I would say is that there is some current that goes through my Ampian loop. And, of course, there is a magnetic field. Uh, if I try to maybe color in the area that's enclosed by the loop, you can see that that wire goes straight through. But here's what bothered Maxwell, and hopefully now we'll start bothering you, is he said, let's kind of look near the capacitor. He said, let's take a loop, and so I'll make kind of a big loop here around the capacitor. And if you color in the uh, surface, and here's where I would say he's thinking outside of the box. He's saying, look, if you look at that surface, that surface is in the plane, but there are other surfaces. Let me do a different color. If you could imagine a surface that is kind of a bow shape, and so the surface is really more of a cone shape, and so maybe call this surface number two, and surface in the green number one, he said that there's a big problem here because the green surface actually has the wire going through it and has some current and therefore should give you a magnetic field. But the second surface, this red surface, 
as it bows through the capacitor does not have a current through it. And according to Ampere's law, without any current, there'd be no magnetic field. Yet, those two surfaces are still enclosed by the same loop. One is in a plane and one is more in a cone shape. But it really bothered Maxwell. Does that mean that Ampere's law is only true for flat surfaces? Or is there something missing? Is there something more here? Now let me take this as an opportunity to turn on one of the diagrams here in the, in the book because my uh, uh, 3D picture is probably not as good as the book here. And so here's what I'm, I'm trying to show you and here's what your author shows you in that first diagram. Your author says, uh, take a look at and here's the path in green and surface number one and it's colored in blue and I guess I colored mine in green but I probably should have matched the colors a little bit better but but he's, he's saying the same thing that I'm trying to say here that if you look through the current that goes through surface number one you will see that there is a current but yet, surface number two that kind of makes this bow that goes between the plates of the capacitor has no current through here. And so I'll say it again in case you missed it. This, this really bothered him and hopefully now is starting to bother you because it's saying, look, <clears throat> if you took one surface that the surface one, you would say there is a magnetic field. If you took the other surface, surface number two, you would say there is no magnetic field. So it can't be both. What's wrong here? What's, what's missing? Uh, he also switched this thinking. Uh, as I said, you might think in your mind, oh, well, maybe Ampere's law really just meant for things in a plane. But you see it a little better in this diagram. What if, <coughs> excuse me, what if you take a path and the path with the plane is actually between the capacitors, so we'll still call that surface number two, and then you take the bowed one, which again is surface number one. Again, surface number one has a current going through it, but surface number two doesn't. And, and, and so again, here's a big dilemma to him. He's looking at this going, wait a minute, one surface says there is a current and therefore there's a magnetic field, but the other surface is saying no current and therefore no magnetic field. And, and this just smells like something is wrong. Something is missing. And that was Maxwell's genius. He, he didn't want to say, well, the answer was just only do flat surfaces because looking at this picture if you do a flat surface you would say then there is no magnetic field between the two plates and that would be like saying okay well the magnetic field is just where there's current 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 it stops then there's current 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 and and, and he didn't buy that and so what he said and what this chapter centers around is that there is something missing. And the, Ma, uh, Ampere's law is incomplete in, in his mind. There's, a, there's another term here. And another piece of this insight is, remember Faraday's law? Faraday's law says we created an EMF. That, that's essentially saying an electric field because there's a changing magnetic field. Well, this got Maxwell thinking. And let's come back to the picture. Maybe there's a symmetry in nature. Nature has a lot of symmetries. Uh, we saw that earlier on when we said, what's a motor versus a generator? And they really were the same physics, but in reverse. And so he thinks that there's a symmetry here. He says, well, if you look here at surface number two, there is an electric field. 
and that electric field is changing while there is current. You see, when there is what we call conventional current flowing into the capacitor, as the conventional current flows into the capacitor, the charge on the capacitor then is building up. And that means then the electric field is, is changing. And so this was Maxwell's brilliance. He says, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe this is the answer. Maybe in this spot between the capacitor, what's going through my surface is not a conventional current where I have real charges that are moving, but maybe instead I have something the equivalent to a current. In other words, a missing current. And the word he's going to use then is a displacement current. So he writes this as mu naught times I sub D, uh, sub D for a displacement current. Well, you heard me earlier say, I'm not real crazy about the name, but that's what he called it. Number one, because this missing current, when you use the word displacement, I don't think it has the same uh, meaning today. So, like I said, there's something missing, something displaced. And so, if you remember it that way, you'll hopefully be kind of in, you know, understanding what his thinking is. There's a, there's a missing current. But the other reason I'm not real crazy about it, and I'm going to use this as an opportunity then to point out that it's not a real current. It's not a conventional current. It's not a flowing of charges. It's, it's not just that it's missing. It's that it's not even a current in the, in the traditional sense that it's a flowing set of charges. What it is, is something that's equivalent to a current. It is actually a changing magnetic flux, or changing magnetic field, which is then the flux in it. Uh, electric, like, sorry, I think I, I said that. It's a changing electric field or a changing electric flux. And so if you think about Faraday's law again, together with Ampere's law, so Ampere's law said one way to make a magnetic field, and so we learned this a long time ago, but one way to make a magnetic field <clears throat> is with moving charges, which I'm going to now call conventional current. But then we learned a second way of making a, uh, or excuse me, now we are learning a second way of making the magnetic field, and that is with a changing electric field. And that actually finishes the symmetry. I, I like to explain it this way as we come to this last chapter and we, we have our, our symmetry. Um, if I use my, my right hand over here to represent the electric field and my left hand to represent the magnetic field, the first thing we learned here was Coulomb's law slash Gauss's law. And we said, how do you make an electric field? And so at the beginning of this semester, we said, the way you make an electric field is with charges. Okay, and we spent a lot of time there. Eventually, we got to magnetic fields, what we called Ampere's Law. And we said, how do you make a magnetic field? And we said, well, you make a magnetic field by having moving charges, a current, which I'm going to call now a conventional current. And so this was chapters 23 and 24, the first way we learned to make an electric field, and then now we, the, the first way we learned a magnetic field, I think it was chapter 29, uh, where we had Ampere's Law. But then fairly recently, and I guess it was chapter 32, Faraday's Law, we said there is a second way of making an electric field. The second way of making the electric field was from a changing magnetic field. And so I'm trying to finish today on this semester with the second way of making a magnetic field, which is a changing electric field. So with the holidays coming up, we have uh, Thanksgiving, which might be more like Zoom giving, and, but whether it's a Zoom giving for you or Thanksgiving, if you're sitting around and grandma asks, Hey, how's school going? What did you learn? 
you could say, hey, Grandma, did you know there are two ways to make an electric field? And just as fascinating, there are two ways to make a magnetic field. So I'll say it again. Electric fields are made by charges and a changing magnetic field. How are magnetic fields made? Conventional currents and and I'm going to stay away from the word displacement current, but the second way is then a changing electric field. So changing magnetic fields make electric, changing electric fields make magnetic. Oh, wait, did I mess that up? So electric fields. Electric fields are made by changing magnetic fields and magnetic fields are made by changing electric fields. So there's an interplay between the two. That's the new and big discovery. Oops, bummer. Let me hold that off here for a second. All right, so let's keep going through Maxwell's thinking. Maxwell's thinking, as I said, <clears throat> is that maybe the answer to this missing piece, this what we will now call the displacement current, is actually buried in this little uh, diagram. <clears throat> and so he says right here that this displacement current should be equivalent to the conventional current. So that way, if you're looking at a loop in a plane of surface number one, you would use the conventional current. <clears throat> but if you made a loop through the capacitor, you would say it still is making the same magnetic field. It's just what cuts through it is not conventional current, but a changing electric field. And so he decides to give this some thought. Now, as you are probably aware or well of, conventional currents is dq dt. If you then use the idea of a capacitor and in place of the charge building up on the capacitor, you write it as the capacitance times the voltage. So going back to our capacitors, I guess that's chapter uh, 26, uh, you would have this equation. If you take another step and remember at least for the parallel plate capacitor and that's kind of what I've drawn here the capacitance is epsilon naught times the area of the capacitor divided by D the voltage from our capacitor is our electric field times the distance between the capacitor the two D's will cancel off. If I bring the epsilon naught out in front, so the permittivity of free space out in front, and then I'm left with this, a derivative of the electric field times the area, that would be the flux, right? That is our definition of electrical flux. If we go all the way back to Gauss's law then, this would be mu naught d and then how the electrical flux changes with time. And so I think a better way of writing displacement current is not by putting a little current with a sub d in it, but to write it out as what it really is. It, it is not a current that is missing, it is not even a current at all. It is a changing electrical flux. And so Maxwell proposes that Ampere's law as we know it is missing a piece. And that piece, like I said, sometimes referred to as the displacement current but I think better written as what it really is, 
and that is the time derivative of the electrical flux. And so it's this new term, which we call the Maxwell term, uh, that this whole chapter centers around. <clears throat> and if you wanted to really kind of summarize this whole chapter, I would say this is the whole chapter right here. It's all about the new and last piece. And so I'll say it again and probably a few times before we're done with today's lecture, and that is there are two ways to make an electric field, and you've already learned them. Oh, one was Gauss's law and the other was Faraday's law. But there's also now two ways to make a magnetic field. One you already learned, it's Ampere's law, and the one I'm trying to introduce you today is the second way to make a magnetic field is by a changing electric field or changing electric flux. And so that is this added piece. And, and so I should then say that we like to then title this now, not as Ampere's Law, but as Ampere Maxwell's Law to give both of them credit for what they've done. And so I will put here Ampere Maxwell's Law. And that one equation now gives us the two ways of making a magnetic field. And that's a section one. That's the first and big piece of this, of this chapter. The rest of the chapter then is going to just kind of spend some time and saying, what about this piece? What consequence does it have? Now, if you remember the title of this chapter, it is Electromagnetic Waves. And that's the biggest piece and really what we're only going to have time to, to focus on. So let me go on to section two here because section two, I think your author does a good job once he just introduces you here to the Ampere Maxwell's equation and he says, why don't we then as we get to the end here of all of our electricity and magnetism, we put a little summary. And I've already said it in words, but let me write it on the board here. I would say then that what we've learned over the semester here is that electrical fields, electric fields, are produced by, and we have two conditions, A, charges, and so that's our Gauss's law. And electric fields are also produced by a changing magnetic field. And that's our Faraday's law. But what I'm trying to also introduce you to is that there's a symmetry in nature and I am going to say then that magnetic fields are produced by and I want to say the two conditions again. Uh, the first one is our conventional or what your author calls the conduction current, the actual physical movement of charges, charges that, that actually move. That's our Ampere's law that you've already seen. But what's new here then is the second one, and that is if you have a changing electrical field, and I should put slash flux because really the equation has flux in it, although it also has field in it, as you will see with some more advanced math before today's, today's over here. Uh, so your, your author says, okay, well, let's take these two ideas. And again, 
to summarize the chapter, uh, let me write these out in mathematical form. All right. So the first one we came across was right here. How do we make electric fields? What did we see way back in chapters 23 and 24? We said electrical fields come from charges. And so this was the integral over a closed surface. That is the electrical flux through a closed surface. Then is equal to the charge inside of that closed surface over epsilon naught. That is called Gauss's law. And so I will put right next to it here Gauss's law, our first of our electromagnetic phenomenon that we saw this semester. Now, later on, and more near the end here in chapter 31, uh, we said that there is another way to get an electric field. And of course, an electric field around a loop is an EMF, so we call this Faraday's law. Uh, we said that there would be an EMF. Now, when we first were introduced to it, uh, we wrote it as an EMF, but let me now write it as an integral around a loop of E dot D S so that you can see the equation with the electric field part in it. Uh, we said that equals to negative of the time derivative of the magnetic flux. Uh, which maybe I should write that as what magnetic flux is, which is an integral of B dot D A. So you could see the glory of the calculus here, where we've got an integral along a surface, uh, we've got a time derivative, and we've got an integral, oh, sorry, integral over a line, and this is an integral over a surface, and this is a time derivative. Then we've got dot products in there, so that means we've got vectors. So there's a lot in that little equation. As you know, it wasn't real easy to work with, but I would say that that is mathematically describing these words. In fact, this will give me a chance to use my favorite phrase, read the math. If I were to stand here, I would say what? I would say an electric field is created by a changing magnetic field. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what that math is, is telling me. And of course, then the math tells me the strength between the two. And so Faraday's law says, yes, you will get an electric field. An electric field over a distance is an EMF. And it is then proportional to the change of the magnetic flux changing. And so that's our Faraday's law. In fact, I should probably put then uh, right here next to it, this is Faraday's law. And so that was our two uh, electric fields. In fact, it might be a while before I need the uh, screen here. So I probably need more whiteboard than I need screen here. So I'm going to turn that off. Now, as we continued on with this semester, we got into magnetic fields. Of course, before we really understood Faraday's law, which involved magnetic flux, we had a discussion about the magnetic flux. And we said, if you ever did a closed surface because there's no monopoles, a closed surface would give you zero. So that's often listed as equation number two, that if you do a integral of the magnetic flux on a closed surface, you get uh, zero. Uh, you might remember that discussion. Well, we said that was a good discussion done by Gauss, and so we call this also uh, Gauss's law, but to narrow it down, we say Gauss's law of magnetism. But it's kind of a boring one in the sense that it doesn't really give us any tools to calculate the magnetic field. It can be useful at times, that's true, and it is a nice piece of the phenomenon. And when you read the math, it says there are no monopoles, 
but it is nonetheless one of the series of four equations I want to summarize the semester with but it's one that we kind of brushed through kind of quickly because we said look does that give us a chance to get the magnetic field no and so that's how we got then into Ampere's law because Ampere's law gave us essentially the same kind of tool that Gauss's law it gave us this tool right here which said that if you then added up or integrated the magnetic field on a loop uh, not a surface so uh, Gauss does it on a surface and comes out to be zero for any surface so it doesn't really help us find the magnetic field but Ampere's law said here that it would be equal then to uh, this uh, where this is an integral of a loop and then this is the current that goes through the area that's enclosed by that that loop and so this fourth equation is really saying right here how do we make magnetic fields we make them by a current and then of course this last piece the one that's new this chapter but this is our final step is the Maxwell piece which is right here there is another way of creating a magnetic field and so that's this piece right here which then says mu naught epsilon naught then the time derivative of the electrical flux and so we've got magnetic flux uh, and if you want I could write this out with what the integral is because it's kind of nice to see that then this would be an integral of E dot dA uh, notice again it's not a closed surface uh, if it was a closed surface we would then you know probably substitute Gauss's law back into here but that's 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 not what we ha we have this would be the surface that is enclosed by this loop and so I thought it would be good and I, I like what your author did here your author in section two says we should summarize everything we've done including the new piece that we're trying to learn here in this uh, chapter and so that's what he's doing here in section two he's saying if you know these four equations uh, together with one more piece of information uh, don't forget that our charges have forces on them and the first thing we learned back in chapter 23 is the force on a charge in an electric field and then a little bit later I believe it was chapter 29 uh, we learned that there would be a force on a charge in a magnetic field but only if it's moving and so this is what we often refer to as equation number five now it's not really kind of in the same ballpark as these these are all telling me the interplay of the electric and the magnetic field uh, this is really telling me the force on those charges but of course if there's forces on those charges then those charges move in a different way and as they move in a different way that means their current is different which means their magnetic field is different and if their magnetic field is different that means the electric field is different and if the electric field changes then it'll push the charges and the charges will have a new current and a new current will make a new magnetic field and a new magnetic field will make a new electric field and a new electric field will push them in a different way which makes a different current which makes a new magnetic field which then makes a new electric whoa this is going to get hard <laughs> yeah these interplay with each other in a very interesting and complex way and that's what I want to show you today a oh, one of the most simplest ways that they can interact uh, with each other um, I suppose for completeness here uh, I should have put that we call this equation the uh, Lorenz force and this one here which I already labeled over there but I'll repeat it here 
this is the Ampere uh, Maxwell's law. And so what I'm trying to get across to you, and like I said, I really like what your author did here in uh, section two, uh, because it, like I said, section one, he first introduces you to the last piece of physics for E and M. And then he says, if you put all that together, this is it. This is the whole semester in a nutshell. Uh, it sounds overly simplified, but if you would like to kind of summarize the whole chapter and really understand everything you've done all semester long. This is it. It's just those four equations counting five with the Lorentz force. I can guarantee you that everything we've done on test one, on test two, and coming up on test three, and coming up on the final exam can be answered right here. So if you can memorize these five equations, you, you got this semester nailed. And so I like to say, but jokingly, I mean, how hard can this class be? I mean, <laughs> look, it, it fits on one whiteboard. You could memorize this in about 10 minutes. Well, obviously, the meaning behind those is pretty complicated. So, like I said, if you want to put it in words and you're uh, meeting with grandma or even friends or Zooming with them, and anybody asks about your school, this would be a good answer for them. Hey, there's two ways to make an electric field. Here they are. There are two ways to make a magnetic field. And if they're still listening, you could say, do you want to see how you write those in equation forms? Because it is kind of neat to put this on a little note card and stick it on your refrigerator and say, you see all these? This is what I did this semester. What did you do in your classes? All right, well, hopefully, I'm getting the summary across here that they are these four. And by the way, <clears throat> the first person to list these uh, in, this, in this form and to write them mathematically instead of words, because I think Faraday's law can be misleading here because we've been writing it in mathematical form since we were introduced to it. But the truth is, uh, Faraday did not write it in mathematical form. Uh, vector calculus was still being developed, and so he really didn't even have that tool. That tool did not e exist. Um, and so it was Maxwell who took the words of Faraday and put it into an equation form. That's why collectively we call these four Maxwell's equations. Right? They're, they're not Maxwell's laws. He, he didn't discover all four of these. I want to make that clear. He discovered just the final piece of this puzzle, and an important piece, as we'll see. Uh, I was going to say maybe the most important, but that, 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 that's, that's not a good description. That would be like saying what's more important, your ear or your eye. I mean, they're, 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 they're both uh, <laughs> extremely important here. All right. So this last piece, though, is a major discovery. But it's the collectiveness of all four of these that are then referred to as Maxwell's equations. Because again, he took the words of Faraday and put it in math form. And Gauss's was pretty much a math form, but it was a little different looking than this, and also with Ampere's law. And so he put it in the form that we're familiar with. That's why they're referred to as Maxwell's equations. Uh, before Maxwell's, they were done in a different mathematical form or just in words. And people would then refer to, well, that's Maxwell's sets of equations. So if you want to do it that way, you do Maxwell's equations. Uh, here's what I want to emphasize in this summary. Uh, because if you talk to anybody who has some kind of knowledge of electromagnetics, their first reaction to you will be, oh, you're learning Maxwell's equations. And it just dawned on me in the last Zoom session that nowhere in the book, and my fault too, have we ever used the term Maxwell's equations. So until today, you, you know, if somebody would have asked you, are you learning Maxwell's equations, you would have said, oh no, no. No, we haven't done that yet. Are you sure that's part of e and We're almost done. We only have a week left. <laughs> and uh, I want to just rest assured that, yes, all of E&M is described with Maxwell's equations. And yes, you have been doing Maxwell's equations. 
just nobody told you these were Maxwell's equations. So I'll say it again, these four equations are Maxwell's uh, equations. Uh, this last piece is his law, this is the Ampere Maxwell's law. So again, they're not Maxwell's laws, this is Maxwell's law, it's just, it's just that one. But these are Maxwell's equations. This is how he wrote them. And Lorenz, of course, wrote the force on them. So we've got the, the Lorenz force. So, like I said, your author does a great job here of summarizing this before he moves in to section three, which is to say, well, what's the consequence of this term? And I'm going to use this as an opportunity. I hope it doesn't take too much time, but I thought it would be worth it because there is another way of looking at these four equations. Now, to do that, we need to do some vector calculus, which at this school, that would be Calc 3, which is Math 200. Now, with that said, I will note that Math 200 it was not a prerequisite for this class. It was a co-requisite. Uh, so all of you guys are now at the end of your Math 200. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to say, okay, now that you know Math 200, because there's only a week left, let me use Math 200. Let me do something kind of clever here. It'll actually make section three easier. Your author does it, the, what I'll call it the hard way, because he does the integral form. I'm gonna do it the easy way, which is the differential form, but you gotta know some math 200. So that's why I was waiting towards the end. Plus, this is a good transition because we are at the end of this semester. The next time you take electromagnetics, it will be assumed in that class that not only did you have this class, so you know the basic electromagnetics that you learned in free space that we're going through now, but it's also going to be assumed that you know more calculus, that you know calc 3, that you know vector calculus. So I thought it would be good today to at least show you a little bit of how you will start doing your Maxwell's equations in a different form. Uh, watch this. Um, let me start with Gauss's law. Uh, I will come over to here. Uh, maybe I will start by just rewriting Gauss's law. And then ask you about your Math 200 class. You probably learned what's often referred to as the divergence theorem. Uh, the Gauss divergence theorem. It goes perfect with Gauss's law. It says simply this, that if you had some kind of area, so let me just kind of take a circle and so a, a sphere, and you have a little charge in there, okay? This is saying if you add up the electric field on that surface, the divergence theorem says you can change this integral from an integral from the surface of the sphere to the volume that is inside. But instead of adding up the electric field, you would add up the divergence of the electric field. And so we can switch, and for those of you that I'm sure went through these in Math 200, which I guess should be all of you, uh, you probably know the difficulty of switching then from a surface integral to a volume integral. Or you see the advantages of that. And, and I'm trying to show that to you now. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Gauss's law as you were introduced to it, this integral. So we often refer to this as Gauss's law in integral form. And I'm going to play a little game here. Uh, I showed you the first one, which is to use the divergence theorem to change it from an integral in terms of a surface to an integral in terms of volume. But I'm going to play another game on the right-hand side, 
Remember, this says this is the charge that is inside of my volume. So I could replace that with the charge density times the volume and add it up over that whole volume. And maybe now you begin to see the advantage of this step because I have an integral with volume and an integral with volume. Uh, they're the same volumes, so that means the integrants must be equal. And so this says that the divergence of the electric field must equal to the charge density over the permittivity of free space. And so this right here is a form that, that you haven't seen yet because as you can see to get there I had to use some of my vector calculus. But I'm trying to say this is the same thing as this. And that's why we refer to this as Gauss's law in differential form as opposed to this one over here uh, which we call Gauss's law in integral form. And so I know that uh, when you take your next E&M class, uh, it might be very likely that your professor comes up to the board and your professor goes, hey, remember you learned Gauss's law, kind of the first thing? Let's just summarize that so we can move beyond. And the professor will probably put this on the board and say, all right, here's Gauss's law. And I just want to warn you that you may look at that going, whoa, 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 what? <laughs> or if I didn't warn you, you might look at that and go, that, I've never seen that before. That's not what we did at City College. What we did at City College was, was this. Well, I'll say it again. What the professor at your next level is going to expect is that you can do the vector calculus. So whether the professor writes it in this form, which again I'll call the differential form, or writes it in this form, I want to take this as an opportunity to kind of give you some heads up for your next semester. That's also, let me point out, for any of you who are out there panicking, none of this would be on test three or the final, okay? You don't have to do any of this fancy divergence theorem and you don't have to solve it in its differential form. That is not what this class is about. But I do want to take a moment to pause and say, let's get ready for your future, okay? And be prepared to start working with these type of equations. And so it's a differential equation as opposed to this equation, which is an integral equation. And that's why I wanted to take a, a moment to say, look, even though it's going to take a little extra time, I, I, I think it's worth seeing and hopefully also uh, relieving a little stress that, hey, don't worry about this fancy math we're about to do because it's not on test three and it's not on the final, but it's good that you, you, you see it. Um, and I think the, maybe the author should have taken it maybe a little bit further to prepare you for your next class. But let me do the second equation. Remember the second one, Gauss's Law of Magnetism? Can you kind of see the same thing? Uh, maybe I'll do this one a little bit uh, quicker, but if I came over here and wrote the integral over a closed surface of b dot dA equals to zero, and I applied the divergence uh, theorem, I would get b, uh, the, the gradient to dot the magnetic field, I'd integrate it over a volume, and still be equal to zero, uh, which means then that this del dot b uh, would have to be zero, and so this would be the second of Maxwell's equation. This is the Gauss's law of magnetism written in differential form. And so these are the first two big steps of taking it from an integral form and using our vector calculus and getting this form. Uh, well, I'll keep going here. And uh, let me also apply our vector calculus that you are currently learning in 200 or learned beyond this <clears throat> about these two uh, equations. 
Uh, I'll start with Faraday's law. And Faraday's law says if I take this integral uh, over a closed loop, E dot ds, I will then get, and let me put it in this form here, uh, negative the derivative of the magnetic flux. All right, so I'll start there. And then let me take advantage of our vector calculus. And I, ink's getting low here. So I'm gonna, before this dries out too much, do a quick refill here. Oops, got it all over my hand. It wasn't completely gone, but that's okay. I wanted to make sure I didn't run out in the middle. Uh, all right. And let me apply a little vector calculus here. And you might recognize this as Stokes' theorem. See, over here, the divergence theorem changed a surface integral into a volume integral. We have another nice technique from our vector calculus, which would change a line integral into a, a surface integral. And so if you take the curl of the electric field and then do an integral over the surface, uh, the surface that, of course, was enclosed by this line integral, you would get that. <clears throat> and now, of course, maybe you see the advantage of this because over here on the other side of the equation, the right-hand side of the equation, there is already that surface integral. And so now we have a surface integral on, on both sides. And just like we did for Gauss's law, and Gauss's law of magnetism, so Gauss's law of electricity and Gauss's law of, uh, we can get rid of the integral. Now I suppose I should probably do uh, one more step and for continuous functions, I can bring the derivative inside and call it a partial derivative. So I'll put the little funny symbols, again, using some of your math uh, 200 here. But the main step I want to get at then is since both of these are an integral over the same surface, the integrants must be equal. So this says the curl of the electric field then would be equal to the derivative, time derivative, of the magnetic field. And so again, at the risk of maybe taking a little bit of extra time, and if this bores you, you can kind of zip the video forward and not watch this extra stuff. Because again, this will not be on exam number three. This will not be on the final exam. Uh, it's just going to help me do section three and we'll show you some neat stuff a little easier, but also kind of give you a little insight to your, your, your future here. But the reason I like this form, and, and let me say this form is then the differential form. So coming over here, this is then referred to as Faraday's law in integral form, and that's how you were introduced to it. I'm trying to show you what it is its equivalent to, and that would be this is Faraday's law in differential form. But the reason I really like this differential form, it fits more with the words I've been saying all semester long. Doesn't this say right here, a changing magnetic field makes an electric field. I've been saying it, but it doesn't really read that way in integral form. In integral form, it says a changing flux. Now it's a magnetic flux. Makes an electric field. But it really doesn't say it in the way I've been saying it until you see it in its differential form. 
that a changing magnetic field makes an electric field. And even then, it's not an electric field, it's a curl of the electric field. So, uh, but we're going to go through some math with that in just a second. Now, also, uh, let's watch this last one. This might be the harder of all of them, but we can do the same step for this fourth one. We can write it in differential form. Uh, we can apply then the Stokes theorem to the left hand side. And so instead of taking an integral along a path, we could then take the curl of the magnetic field. And so the curl of the magnetic field within the area that is enclosed by that path. And so that's that same step that I did here. It's just the Stokes theorem in our vector calculus uh, class. Okay, so if I do this, uh, let's look at the other side of this. Uh, equation. And maybe I'll, I'll go to this form. Uh, this has the mu naught, mu naught. Uh, then this is the current that goes through that surface. But let me play the same game that I played back here with Gauss's law. This was the charge that was enclosed that volume, so I took the charge density and added it up over that volume. So over here, what I'm going to do is take the current density and add it up in that area. Because if I take the current density, that's the J, and I add it up over that area, that would be the total conventional current that goes through uh, that surface. And then if I continue on with this one, uh, which is mu naught, epsilon naught. And I play that same game where I put the derivative inside. So this then becomes the partial of the electric field with time, dA. I think I can just squeeze it in here. Then you will notice that every term in this equation equation now has an integral over the area, uh, the area that was enclosed by the path that we would have called an Ampian loop if we were doing it in the integral form. And so this says then that the curl of the magnetic field is then equal to mu naught times the current density plus uh, permeability of free space, permittivity of free space, and the changing electric field with time. And so this would be the fourth of Maxwell's equations, but written in its differential form. So I'll say it again, if anybody's panicking out there, you don't need to worry about the four Maxwell's equations written in differential form. That, that is not at all what this lecture is about, at least in terms of getting you ready for this semester. But this, I'll call it deviation from the book a little bit, is hopefully a long-term benefit so that when you transfer and you take your next e &M course, you'll be able to quickly come up to speed when you start working with these. You say, yeah, I learned them in this way. I learned them in the integral form, but I also learned my Math 200. And so if I put my Math 200 together with the physics I learned in 122, I see how these four equations then are the same thing. And therefore, I'm going to continue my studies in E&M, but it's, I'll call it more an advanced study because I'll be studying them in their differential form. And so I'm going to actually use them in their differential form to get to what the ultimate step of this uh, chapter is. Uh, even though you could get them to their integral form, that's a lot harder. And so your author in section three keeps the integral form and he goes through a, really a lot of extra work that I'm sure he feels is required because the prerequisite for this class is not Math 200. But we're also at the end of the semester, and so I think I'm going to go ahead, like I said, and use that 
to my advantage to save a little time and I think your advantage in the sense that now you actually get a chance to see Maxwell's equations in both their integral form and their differential form. All right, so I'm going to leave Maxwell's equations in their differential form up here on the board. Let me erase uh, Maxwell's equations in their integral form. And let's move then into section three here of the book and say, what is section three? And I will tell you, this is really the main thrust of this chapter because this is the new piece of physics that we learned in section one. And now we want to learn the consequence of that. And now you'll see why the title of this chapter is called Electromagnetic Waves. This is the big piece. In fact, here is kind of Maxwell's thinking. He is going to ask this question. He says, well, what if I came over to some place over here? And I'll just say over here because I do have some equipment that I want to show you. And I have some electronic equipment with some power supplies. And I could hook up the power supplies and I could make charges move. I can make current. But let's take a moment and read what this is saying. All right. So we come over to here. And maybe that first step would be to say, all right, so I have some current. Current would be this term, makes a magnetic field. Okay, so I have a current and a wire and I make a magnetic field. Oh, sure. We've been, you know, we were introduced to that in, in, in chapters uh, 29 and 30. Okay. But here's an interesting consequence. If the current was changing it would be making a magnetic field that is changing. Now, Faraday's law says that magnetic field that you just made from the conventional current that is now changing would do what? Well, it would make an electric field. But then, wait, what are we learning today? That electric field would then make a second magnetic field. Wait, wait, wait. So are you telling me that what I would get when I turned on a current that was changing, I would get a what you might call a first magnetic field. And that first magnetic field would make a first electric field. Uh huh. But then that first electric field would also be changing, so it would make a second magnetic field. Uh huh. But wait, it doesn't stop there. This second magnetic field would then also be changing. So this second magnetic field would make what? A second electric field. But wait, that second electric field is going to make a third magnetic field, which is changing. And so that third magnetic field is going to make a third electric field. And that third electric field is going to be changing, so it's going to make a fourth magnetic field. And that fourth magnetic field is going to be changing, so it's going to make a fourth electric field. And that fourth electric field is going to make a fifth magnetic field. And that fifth magnetic field is going to make a sixth, uh, I mean a fourth electric field, uh, wherever number I was. And so you get the idea that one creates another. And Maxwell begins to ask this question as he reads the math. Could something like this happen? Could I start over here with some electronics where I have a current? And that current makes the first magnetic field. But that magnetic field makes the first electric field. And that first electric field makes the second magnetic field. And that second magnetic field makes a second electric field. And that second electric field makes a third magnetic field. And that third magnetic field makes a third electric field. And that third electric field makes a fourth magnetic field. And that fourth magnetic field makes a fourth electric field. In other words, if I were to stand over here, would there be an electric and magnetic field here? There's no charges near me. They're way over there. And the answer seems to be yes. And the pattern and the shape of this field right here is following the pattern of the current. 
And if you're not quite getting what I'm saying out of this, do you see here that if I took a wire with current in it and I had information in the pattern of this current, further away, some distance off, there would be both electrics and magnetic fields that the pattern here is exactly that pattern. And so if you're not seeing this, maybe if I hold this up, it will help. <laughs> what is this? How does it work? And over there is a transmitter and I'm the receiver. And so that transmitter, that antenna, has current in it. And as the current moves around in a particular pattern, it will radiate from the transmitter and electromagnetic waves will build up. And over here then, my receiver will be able to pick up those fields and be able to tell me, what were you trying to communicate? You're miles away from me, but I can pick up what you're trying to communicate. And so I can text somebody, or I can video them, or I can even have an old-fashioned conversation with them. And this is what wireless communication is. We are going to call this electromagnetic wave. And that's what I want to show you, both in concept and with... Let me start with concept, because this is kind of neat to see. And so, although I bumped it earlier, let's see if I can reassemble it. I had put over here on my workbench a receiver. Okay. You would say, oh, it's just a radio. Yeah, it's just a radio, and I actually have it set on the AM dial. And if I were to switch over, maybe I can find a, a music station. You can pick it up here. Maybe I'll turn it down a little bit so it doesn't over, overwhelm you. But, but how, do this, how does this receiver get that information? And I claim that over somewhere, I don't know where this radio station is coming from, but I'll just point in that direction, since that's TV Hill, but I don't think this is a local uh, station. But if, if there is the, the transmitter, on that transmitter, they have current in a wire. It's going up and down, and it has a pattern. And that current makes a magnetic field, and that magnetic field makes an electric field, which makes a magnetic field, which makes an electric field, which makes a magnetic field, which makes an electric field. And then eventually, right here where I'm standing, there is a pattern, and this radio picks it up. I mean, watch this for a second. We learned way back in chapter 23 or 24 that the electric field does not get inside of a metal case. And so here's my metal case. Now, it's not a perfect metal case. I purposely made it out of this mesh wire so that you can still see through it, but hopefully it's thick enough that you will be able to say, well, it's kind of like a metal cage, which means the electric field shouldn't get inside. So what would happen to this receiver if I put it <laughs> inside? The electric field can't get inside or barely gets inside. I can actually sort of hear it. I don't know if you can hear anything on my lapel mic here. But uh, it's picking up just a little bit. And that's because it's not a solid, a solid piece. But definitely, there's a big difference between this and that. And that's what I wanted to convince you of. These are the electromagnetic waves. That's what we really want to study in this chapter. This is a consequence of, and I'll say it again, this term. Without this term, we wouldn't have this continuous process where an electric field makes a magnetic field, and then that magnetic field makes another electric field, and then that electric field makes another magnetic field, and that magnetic field makes another electric field, and that electric field makes another one. And so our information can communicate great, great distances. 
like 93 million miles. And I picked that number because, as you'll see, the sun is 93 million miles from Earth. And we're very familiar with the sunlight. What is sunlight? And hopefully before today's over, I will convince you they are electromagnetic waves. And so we have lots of electromagnetic waves. Now, let me turn this receiver to a frequency that it is tuned to. And of course, you don't hear anything. That's good. So there is no radio station in the area at about 1.2 megahertz. Uh, this one then, uh, the little tuner is a filter that says, give me all the electric fields and magnetic fields that are vibrating at 1.2 megahertz. Uh, that's why you only hear one radio station at a time. If I could see all these fields, I would have every radio station right in front of me. I would also have all the cell phone conversations. I would also have all the, the uh, Wi-Fi. Here's our Wi-Fi over in the corner. All of these fields are here, but my receiver is designed to just turn it, tune into one particular frequency. And so a moment ago, I had it somewhere over here, which looks at about 1.5 megahertz. And so the the radio station is transmitting at 1.5 megahertz. And so, so I'm going to go to a place on the dial here where it seems like I'm not picking anything up. 1.2 megahertz. So that would tell me that right now there are no radio stations out there uh, making the current in the transmitter go up and down at 1.2 megahertz. And the reason I wanted to pick that is because now that'll give me a chance to make my own transmitter. So, it looks like I dropped it here on the ground. But if I take this power supply right here and turn it on, and I was playing with it before the lecture, uh, it is set at 1.169 megahertz. Okay. And so that's kind of close to that. Of course, right now I don't have any current in it, but I'm going to go ahead and put my wire in. And I'm going to take the wire and loop it around. And so I've got a nice long wire here and plug it in. And maybe even you, you hear something on it. Uh, maybe I'll get a little close here and you can kind of pick up some kind of fuzzy stuff here. It uh, might be better if I put my lapel mic near that, and I will in just a, a second here. But I do want to maybe kind of fine tune it. And maybe that will be close enough. Uh, let me take off the lapel mic here. And put the lapel mic right in, in front. I guess I'll ask you, Ron, do you hear a bunch of mumbo jumbo here? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to hopefully convince you that it's coming from my transmitter. I'm going to unplug that wire. See, I no longer have current. See, I no longer had current in my transmitter at that point. And it went away. Now, I'm going to do something even better. Because AM radios, the AM stands for amplitude modulator. And here, here's how they're designed. They're designed to play back not the frequency that you're transmitting, but the rate that the transmitted goes up and down. So I'm going to go over there and get another power supply, another signal generator, and I'm going to set it to some number, about 500. And I'm going to make then my transmitting waves at 1.2 megahertz 
get bigger and smaller at 1.2 million times a second. I mean, sorry, get bigger and smaller about 500 times a second while they are transmitting at 1.2 megahertz. Well, what? down the volume a little bit on my radio here leave it on just enough so you can hear it in the background but what my radio is picking up is it's tuned to the 1.5 megahertz but the second one is then making that amplitude go up and down 500 times and that's what it plays back on the speaker this frequency of 500 in fact watch I'll go back over there and play with it for a second I'll turn this up So now you should hear about 1,000. I think the dial over there said 1,023. <laughs> and so this is my simple way of, of demonstrating the concept of these electromagnetic waves that over there the current makes the first magnetic field but then it makes another and then another and another and eventually over at some distance and this could be you know hundreds thousands millions of miles away there would be this uh, electric magnetic field so hence the name electromagnetic waves and that's what I'm trying to get across now now watch this I can do even something I think uh, more interesting instead of just having it go up and down at a rate of some set frequency by the other generator, I can make it go up and down in the same pattern as my voice. And what do you hear? And you can probably see then, I've uh, set up a microphone. And then, since a microphone doesn't pick up much voltage, I've run it through an amplifier, so that's what that little box in front of my microphone is. But I am going to take this 1.2 megahertz and then vary it according to the pattern of my voice. And this will make then electromagnetic waves that are going bigger and smaller in the pattern of my voice and that's what this receiver picks up and plays back so I'll turn this on Turn it up a little bit so I can hear it. I'm tuned off a little bit. Thank you. 
SBCC broadcasting live at about 3 milliwatts of power, probably. But it says a very, very small amount of power. But it illustrates the concept of the electromagnetic waves. At least I hope it does. So now let's dive into the mathematics here. And... And so I hope I was able to come across there on video of what I like to get across in a face-to-face -face setting. And, and, and that is this whole idea of these waves that even though you can't uh, see them with your eyes, they're there. And then also, hopefully, the math seems to indicate that. So now let's actually get into section three here because we've got some pretty advanced uh, math to do. Uh, let me do this for a moment. Uh, let's talk about the magnetic and electric fields right here. Now I know that they were originally created over here with some current. But once they're created, then as we said, something like the, the fourth one makes the fifth set, the fifth set makes the sixth set, the sixth set makes the seventh set. And so my point is over here, this set of electromagnetic waves, there is no current or charges around here. And so what that would mean then is this equation, uh, that is the magnetic field, would not have this term in it. And of course this one doesn't have any charges in it. I suppose this one over here you could say in terms of the magnetic field there would be no free charges so this one would be zero. But it turns out what I want to show you can all be done with these two equations. So I'm going to just focus on these two. This is Faraday's law and then this is the Ampere Maxwell. This is actually the Maxwell's piece of it. And so because of that, I'm going to go ahead and erase these first two of Maxwell's equations that are in differential form. And I'm going to end up turning the uh, display uh, back on here because your author does a really good job with two pictures. I guess this is the first of his two. And he begins to ask this question, can you have, and I, and I think we've answered this already, but can you have a point in space that has electric and magnetic fields and they are creating each other but you don't have any free charges around. And that's what I'm trying to say. And we'll hopefully show you after we read the math that the math says that the answer is yes. Yes, you can have an electric and magnetic field in empty space. You don't have to have charges. Now, I'll say it again, you've got to initiate them with some charges over here. That's why we call this the transmitter. But once you get away from that transmitter, right here, you have electromagnetic fields, which create new electromagnetic fields, which create new electromagnetic fields, which create even more electromagnetic fields. And the pattern is made from each other, so that's why over here I can have a receiver that picks up either the electric or magnetic or both, and that pattern then is reminiscent of what is going on, and so I can communicate wire Wirelessly. I can communicate with these electromagnetic fields and that's what I want to show you. And so Maxwell gets really excited about this. In fact, he gets even more excited when, as we read the math. And there's some pretty tricky math here, so I might have to read it for you. But he says here that, okay, if you have free space, this one would go away. And so is there a solution? And if there is a solution, what would it look like? And as we'll see, there is a solution. And you'll see it's got some pretty tight restrictions, but that's what we want to learn. 
what is the requirement of these electromagnetic fields. All right, so let's do this. Let's say that right here, if there's possible, and so this is where Maxwell is starting with his math, is it possible that I have an electric and magnetic field that are feeding on each other? And so if there is, there, you know, let's say the electric field is in some direction like this. Whatever direction that is, he calls it the y direction. <clears throat> and so let me come over here to his diagram. And he says, let's take a grid. And he starts off by saying, and he puts it kind of in this burnt orange, that whatever direction this electric field is in, if it, if it could even exist, so remember I'm still kind of asking that question, if it could exist. Obviously I demonstrated that it, that it could. But if it could exist, he said let's call that the y direction. And the reason for that is that'll make our math a little bit easier. So this will become the derivative of the y direction. And that's, that's all we'll have. Uh, so in other words, the electric field would be zero in the i-hat direction, ey in the j-hat direction, and zero in the k-hat direction. And of course we can do that because we can pick our axis anywhere we want. So he's just saying let's make our math a little bit easier. Let's just say, okay, whatever direction the electric field is, that's what I'm going to define as my y direction. Okay, and so that equation would become something like this. <clears throat> now, if you remember how to do your curls, this is the part that I was saying, all right, maybe we've got to do some math that you're either new to you or maybe even not familiar. It's this three by three determinant. It's I hat, uh, J hat, K hat. Uh, then the gradient is the derivative with respect to x, derivative with respect to y, and derivative with respect to z. Uh, and then the magnetic field would be bx, uh, by, uh, bz. And so maybe I should point out that this would be a j hat because there would be zero i hat and zero k hat. So when you do this curl, you're going to get something like this. The i hat component, and so the first part of this curl is to do kind of this swish. And so this would be the derivative of the magnetic field in the z direction. Uh, with respect to y minus the derivative in the z direction uh, of the y component. And that has to equal then this x component which would be zero. Now the, the j component would be when you draw a line through the vertical and the, the horizontal, and then it's the second one, so you'd put a, a negative in front of it. So negative the j hat uh, would be the derivative with respect to x of the z component minus the derivative uh, with respect to z of the x component. That would have to equal mu naught, epsilon naught, times how the electric field in the y direction changes with time. And the last one, the k component, and so let me just say it again because there's a little bit of math here, quite deep math, is I'm trying to answer this simple question. Is there a pattern of electric and magnetic fields that would fit this equation. Because here's what we know from our electromagnetics. We know we can have electric and magnetic fields, and as we read it, we know that an electric field can make a magnetic field, and a magnetic field can make an electric field, and so I'm kind of speculating that there would be these electromagnetic waves going from my transmitter to my receiver, but what would it look like? What would those fields have to look like? What, what do these equations say the limiting factor is for those fields. And that's what I'm trying to, to solve here. And so like I said, I'm just going to start with, hey, there is an electric field. It is only in the y direction. And so let's see what that says the condition of the magnetic field has to be.
So the K components, uh, I guess, partial with respect to X, B, Z, uh, minus uh, B, Z, minus the partial with respect to uh, Z, B, Y, and that one would have to equal a zero. Okay. Now, let me focus my attention on this one. This right here in is a sense saying that there could be a magnetic field. And of course, these three conditions have to be true. But do you kind of see here that this equation, which has x's and z components, is coming from the y component? And so if we take a moment to read this, this is really saying that one of the conditions here is that the magnetic field that is created from this electric field has components in the x and z axis, but not the y axis. In other words, the magnetic field is then perpendicular to this electric field. And if you see that, then you'll understand why the author makes this next step. Uh, maybe I should take three markers here. And to make our math a little bit easier, he does this. Okay, so he's saying if this red marker points up, this is the Y direction the magnetic field would have to be either an X and a Y component. So he says, let's do this. X, X, Z component. He would be in the X, Z plane. And so he says, let's do this with our grid. Since that first, or I guess that's the second equation, is saying that the magnetic field would have an X and Z component, let's rotate the X, Z grid, so if this is the X and Z and here's the Y in red, let's rotate it so that the magnetic field is completely 100% along the Z axis. And so let's do this. Let's say then that the magnetic field has nothing in the X component. We've already shown it has nothing in the Y component, and it has everything then in the Z component. And that might be a little bit hard to see when you read the math. That's why I thought I would read it through. So let me say it again for any of you who might be kind of stressing with this, going, oh, I can't do that math. Good. That's okay. You don't have to do it yet. This is not for this semester. This is kind of helping you to understand the results of this semester, but also getting you ready for next semester. Here's the results I want you to know. The electric and the magnetic are perpendicular to each other. That's what this is saying. So if I were to come over to here and look at the fields, maybe I'll go back to my beginning. If you remember my transmitter, I made a big wire and I purposely made it in a loop because we had learned earlier on that if the current goes in a loop, we can do our right hand rule number two and when the current goes in a counterclockwise direction, the magnetic field would be pointing towards you in the camera. A moment later, the current would be going the other direction because remember, I set this at 1.2 megahertz. So the field would be going towards you, then away from you, towards you, then away from you, towards you and away from you. But the point is, the magnetic field would be this way. And so the electric field would be perpendicular to that. Let's say this way, vertical. 
And so in this diagram, U would be the Z direction. There's the magnetic field. And the electric field would be then up and down. It would be the Y direction. So that's the most important thing that you can get out of this. So I'm going to say it again. If this math made no sense to you, that's fine. That's getting to the next level. But what I do hope you get out of this is a very simple statement that in these electromagnetic waves that we're trying to develop, there is both an electric and a magnetic field and they are perpendicular to each other. That's the beauty of that math. Well, I'll keep going because it gets even better. Because if you write it uh, this way, then, um, this equation here, and maybe I'll keep going in the green, then reduces to this. Um, I've got the mu naught E naught times the derivative of the electric field in the y direction over time. And then, as we said, we're going to align our axis so this term goes away. Oh, and I should have put uh, J hat over here to match. Uh, the J hats will cancel off, uh, and I'll be left with a negative. Uh, the derivative of the magnetic field in the z direction and it would be changing in the x direction. Now I want to talk about this equation a little bit more as we continue here but maybe it would be good then uh, to jump over and by the way uh, the other two doesn't really help me uh, much because uh, let's see, we are saying here that there's only a, a Z uh, component. Um, well, I'll stay away from that because this is uh, going to take quite a while and I, I, I'm burning too much time here. So I want to I wanna focus on that one. But I also want to focus then on what's going to happen over here. Because if I do the same thing, and uh, maybe I'll switch to a different uh, color here, but if I write this as I hat, uh, J hat, K hat, and then the partial with respect to X, the partial with respect to Y, the partial with respect to Z, and as we said, we set this up so that there was only a Y component in our, our grid. And then I would have minus the derivative of the magnetic field. And as we said, then the magnetic field would only be in the Z uh, direction. Then, uh, let's see, I think I can erase this math here. And I can do the determinant of that matrix. And so I'm going to say then, and maybe I'll just jump to the Z component here. So this would be K hat. And so the K hat component uh, would be the partial with respect to X of the y component and then minus zero equals uh, negative of the time derivative of the z component. Well, which if I simplify this, and then that would be a k hat, I would have the negative, the derivative in the z direction with time and over here, I would have a derivative of the uh, electric field in the y direction with respect to x. And so if I box these two and maybe connect to them, here's what Maxwell is saying as we do this math here. He's saying that, okay, if you read this, there will be, 
and here's the changing electric field with time, which is making the magnetic field. Here then is the changing magnetic field that changes with time, and it must make an electric field. And of course, the electric field changes with time. So if we step back and look at this, don't we really have two equations with two unknowns, right? The two unknowns are, what is the electric field and what is the magnetic field? And so can't we combine two equations? Now they're differential equations, ouch. So I got some tough math to do here. But I should be able to solve this for, say, the electric field or the magnetic field. And I'd like to do both. And that is really where we're headed uh, with this. But this really says, if I, if I just pause right here, and I'll say it, what we already showed, we already showed that yes, you can have these electromagnetic fields, but they gotta be perpendicular to each other. But then look at this, look what it is saying. It is saying here that for this to work, the magnetic field has to change with time, but also the magnetic field has to change in the x direction. So it has to change in space. And so these fields are limited to fields that are constantly changing, changing in both space and time. So that means if I come back here and get a mental picture of this, back here, this magnetic field must be changing in the x direction. Remember, this would be the x direction because the magnetic field is the z direction. And the electric field is the y direction. And so if I were to look at the magnetic field, it must be somehow changing as I move across space. But also, as I hold my receiver here at a particular point in space, the field must be changing in time. And so one of the restrictions we see right away that the only way we can satisfy Maxwell's equations here is if our fields, and I'll say it again, are perpendicular to each other and they are changing. They are both changing. They are both changing in terms of time and in space. And so if you get, again, nothing out of this math, get the answer to the math, and that's it. They are perpendicular to each other and they change. They change both in space and in time. Uh, let's keep going as we read the math. Because as I said, I would really like to solve this equation uh, for the, say, the electric field. I'll do the electric field first. So let's see. I, I have electric field here. So maybe I should solve for magnetic fields and put it into here. Okay, now sadly, this is not the magnetic field. This is the derivative of the magnetic field. And it's the derivative with respect to space, where over here I have it with respect to time. So here's a little math I'm going to play. Let me take the derivative with respect to space and then take the derivative yet again. And so this term becomes a second derivative, not of the same variable. The first one was already here with space and now I'm going to do it with time. And the reason for that is over here, I already have the derivative of the magnetic field with respect to time. Uh, let me take it with respect to space. Ah, and so now this term and this term are the same. That's really where I'm going with that. Okay, so over here, I would have to have a second derivative of the electric field with respect to time twice. Because remember, I had taken the derivative of this side with respect to time, so I need to do it over here. And then likewise over here, uh, I needed to take the derivative with respect to space, so I need to do that over here. And so now I can take my two equations with my two unknowns and put them uh, together. And this is the big piece. This 
is what Maxwell discovered. This is what they say got him real excited, this next step. Now, we need to read the math. You may not get quite as excited as he did. He, you know, he got up on his desk and he goes, holy moly, do you see what this is saying? And he probably was the only one who figured it out. And so everybody else was like, no. But, but watch this next step. If you put these two together, this says that the second derivative of the electric field and, of course, we're talking about the y direction, but if you'll let me just drop the, the y direction since that's the only direction of the electric field. I'm just going to put that term and then set it equal to this term, mu naught, epsilon naught, which would be the second derivative of the electric field with respect to time. This is actually a really exciting e equation. And like I said, you, you may not be able to see it because your education is just getting there now with Math 200, and, but this says actually two fascinating things here. Uh, of course, what it says is there is a connection of this electric field. And so what is the solution to that? What is that equation saying? And what you may not know is this is referred to as the wave equation. So the reason Maxwell got so excited is he just then proved that you could have electromagnetic waves. You could have these electric waves. That's what that equation is saying. Now, for me to prove that to you and to show you the second neat thing here, uh, let me do this for a moment. Let me just ask you, some algebra questions here. Let's say that I had like a string with a rope and I just made a little pulse. I made a wave and it looked like this. And then a moment later it moved down the axis and looked like this. So maybe at time equals to zero, here's what it looks like. Uh, a little later when time equals to say T1 or T2, uh, it looks like this. Um, how could you mathematically represent a function that moves in time? Now to answer that I'm going to go back to your math class. If this right here is centered around x and it was centered around zero, how do you take a function and shift it along the x-axis? In other words, if you know a function that is f of x and you want to take the same shape of that function and move it over a little bit, in this case move it to the right. And uh, maybe I want to move it to the right, how about I'll call it x naught. Don't you go f x minus x naught? And so I'll just kind of review your, your algebra. That's a shift on the, on the x-axis. Now, let's put that together with our mechanics. If you wanted it to move at a certain speed where it started at zero and then moved over to x naught after a particular time, then the x naught would be v times t. All right, so I might, if I was doing algebra, not, not, not calculus, not derivatives, but if I was doing algebra, I would call this the wave equation. I would say that if you had any function that followed this pattern, in other words, it changed with both space and time, ooh, sounds familiar, like the electric field changed with space and time, and the space and time were related by this parameter, what that would say is I would have a shape that it starts with this shape and a moment later it has the same shape just shifted over and a moment later it has the same shape shifted over and a moment later it has the same shape shifted over. That's what this algebra is saying. Now watch what happens if I do a little calculus on it. What if I were to take the second derivative of this with respect to x? I guess I would write it as f prime and then f prime. 
because I would take the derivative and the chain rule wouldn't do anything for me, it would just give me a one. Then I'd take the derivative again with another chain rule which would give me one. But watch this. What if I take the second derivative of that same function but with respect to time? What would I get? Well, the first time I took the derivative, I would get f prime. The chain rule would then give me a negative v. So then when I went to take the derivative with respect to time a second derivative, second time, <laughs> uh, I would have a v prime and another chain rule well, which of course the negative would simplify and become v squared v double prime. If I moved this over to here, it would become 1 over v uh, squared times the second derivative with respect to time which would equal f double prime. And f double prime is equal to the second derivative of f with respect to x. Do you see it yet? Do you see that if you ever had something that looked like this equal to this, and isn't that what we have? This is why Maxwell got excited. This is why I'm getting excited. Is because as soon as you see that, especially if you were the first one in history to do this, I think he did this in 1865. If you did this in you know, 1865 and, uh, and you look at this and you see this, you would say, oh my goodness, check this out. This right here is saying the same as this. This is saying then that what we can do is if we come over here and we create a certain field by the current, that will have a pattern that will move. That same pattern will be moving along. And so whatever you know, pattern I have in the magnetic field, it will keep that, it will move. This will be a wave. This is an electromagnetic wave. And so I'm sure, like I said, when I first put this on the board, you didn't get as excited as I or Maxwell did, but if you ever see that equation, what that tells you is the solution is it's a wave. It is a solution that if something has a pattern, it will keep that pattern. Oh, that's why your author, after he goes through uh, deriving all of this says there's a lot of different patterns we could have and the simplest pattern to talk about is just a sinusoidal pattern and uh, here it is and so here's what he's trying to say and what I'm trying to say so I'll say it again if this math was too much I get it I get it. That's, that's, that's not my point of this lecture. I'm not trying to throw in some math 250 or stress you out at the last minute. But what I am trying to get you to see is that if we apply Maxwell's equations and if we study the math, we read the math, here's what they're telling us. They are telling us that they would create an empty space so we don't have any charges around electric and magnetic fields, and as I said before, and I'll say it again, they're perpendicular to each other. In addition to that, this statement is then saying that whatever pattern they have, it will move along the x-axis. And that's why we keep drawing these three dimensions. And so in the problem I was showing you, I would have a magnetic field this way, I would have an electric field this way and whatever pattern it had at that moment it would move that pattern in the x direction and so you get all three dimensions and that's the other piece I want to add to this is know this that there is an electric field and a magnetic field and they are perpendicular to each other and then they move perpendicular to the plane that is made up of that magnetic and electric field. That's the, the beauty of this. That's what this equation is saying. So I'll say it again. You may not be familiar with the little algebra I did here. You may not be even familiar with this as a wave equation, although I think you guys cover it quite well in Math 220, so some of you are probably doing that this semester or already did that. But this is the wave 
equation. And that's the proof. That is the proof that I wanted you to see, that these make these electromagnetic waves, and they continue to propagate. And there's no stopping them. Remember, they build on each other. So could they go for millions and millions of miles? Yes. Now, granted, they spread out, so we need to talk about their energy. And so their energy is going to decrease, uh, or the concentration of their energy, I should say, decreases. So the intensity of them decreases, but their total energy spreads, spreads out. And so the further away I get, the harder it is for me to detect it in my little detector, because it's the same energy spread out over a, a big space. Now, let me look at the second fascinating thing that's buried in this equation. So not only does this tell me the three dimensions, but it also tells me the speed, doesn't it? And so when Maxwell saw this, he got real excited that these were waves and that he realized right away we can use this for long distance communication. The pattern you create at your transmitter will be the same pattern you will get millions or in this case hundreds of miles away. And then how quickly do they travel? Watch this. This is just as fascinating as the fact that they are waves is, all right, this says that one over the speed squared, so in other words, the number that is in front of the second derivative of time, that's, that's this number right here, is the permeability of free space and the permittivity of free space. And so that means their speed would be 1 over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught, which would be 1 over the square root of 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7, and then 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. And if you get out your calculator, you get the amazing number of about 3 times 10 to the 8th. So 300 meters per second. And maybe now some of you are getting excited on this step because uh, 300, right, 300 million meters a second. And so if <clears throat> this number looks familiar, it did to Maxwell, and this is why he got so excited. What is that number? Not only is it fast, so the good news here is if we use this as a form of communication, it will be a fast communication. And so not only can we, you know, span the whole Atlantic, we can communicate from Europe to America with this. But not only is it fast, but what does it have the same number as? And if you recognize this, this was a known number at the time. This is the speed of light. And of course, why Maxwell got excited is he said, and really for the first time in history now, he said, we now have a deeper understanding of our optics. What is light? Light is an electromagnetic wave. It's an electromagnetic wave in a particular part of the spectrum. Remember earlier in this lecture, I said, could transmit 93 million miles. Yes, and the reason I picked that is because one form of electromagnetic waves is the sun. And so what's happening on the surface of the sun is these really hot gases are moving around. In fact, they're so hot that the electrons are removed from the nucleus. And so you have charges that are moving around. And so just like this transmitter, I have charges moving around. And when charges move around, that's conventional current, and that makes a magnetic field. But here's the exciting thing, is that that magnetic field then also makes an electric field. Those then move, remember, right angles to each other, and then they move, and they will keep going until they get to planet Earth. And so we can have these charges moving around the sun making a field. And once they do, according to Maxwell's equation, they keep that same shape and they propagate in the x direction. And 93 million miles away, we receive that sunlight. And so that's why he and I get really excited when you go through all this math and when you come up with this and you calculate the speed and the speed is the speed of light, you realize that 
what light is, is a simple form of electromagnetic waves. In fact, I want to then say that's the whole point of section three of the book. Let me jump all the way to section seven. Because in section seven, your author then says, let's look at the full spectrum here. He gives a nice little graph, which I don't see at the moment in my little folder here. Let me open the book. Give me a second here. So let me go to chapter 34. Let me scroll all the way down to section 7. Let me make it at 100% so you guys can see this. But here is his excitement and my excitement that I want to share with you. This is really the main conclusion here. He makes a little graph here and he says you could have all kinds of frequencies and if you didn't already know this then radio waves AM radio waves and for that matter TV and FM radio waves are all these electromagnetic waves that's what I was showing you with this receiver I was showing you Maxwell's electromagnetic waves here in this range right about here, 1.2 megahertz. But what are microwaves? What are infrared? What is visible light? What is ultraviolet? What are x-rays? What are gamma rays? And I want to communicate to you that those are exactly the same thing. They're electromagnetic waves. They are simply the same thing as we have a current. If that current moves at a particular rate, and in my case it was 1.2 megahertz, it will make a pattern of an electromagnetic field. Remember the electric and magnetic field will be perpendicular to each other. And that pattern will move along in the X direction. And if the currents were faster, well, then they would be up here maybe in the microwaves. And in fact, I brought an old magnetron from an old microwave oven and probably many of you, ah, here it is, use microwaves to warm up your food. We call it, of course, a microwave oven. And so what is happening in that microwave oven is we are generating electromagnetic waves. They get generated to the side or the back depending on the model of the microwave. Then they go through a little tube, a little cavity, and they go down and they blast your food. And so your food gets warmed by the energy that is coming from it in the form of electromagnetic waves. We call them microwaves. And here's an old magneton that we just, you know, it was like this and we just ran it through the bandsaw and cut it in half. And if you look closely at the design, you'll see kind of these spokes and the spokes come close together, but they don't touch. They're like little capacitors here. And uh, you charge them up and the charges flow in kind of this little uh, pie shape here and they go back and forth. And so that little loop is the inductor and the two pieces close together are the capacitor and so we have our LC circuit. And as you recall from our chapter, uh, I guess it was uh, 32, uh, when you have an inductor and a capacitor it will oscillate at a frequency of 1 over the square root of LC. Uh, and so that's what this is. So it's a small inductor, it's also small capacitance and that's why it gets a high frequency. And so our microwave ovens are designed at uh, 2.45 gigahertz. And so that would fit up here in this chart as an electromagnetic wave. Uh, 2.5 gigahertz. Well, here's gigahertz. So here's 10 gigahertz. So maybe somewhere in this range. 
And so that's what this magneton is. Um, I also got this fun little detector. Sadly, you can't see them with your eyes, but here is my little microwave transmitter and detector. This is the transmitter. I will plug it in back here, but this is behaving a lot like you saw earlier with my transmitter. If I just plug this in, this right now is sending out a frequency of about 10 gigahertz. I think it's 10.5 gigahertz. So, um, I'll just call it 10 uh, gigahertz. And so this 10 gigahertz, well, I guess would be right here, so it would be a, a little bit higher in frequency than the waves that are in your microwave oven. <clears throat> these are common microwaves used for communication. Uh, that's why these horns are here. This is blasting it out in this direction. And in this case, the electric field, which I, I wish you could see with your eyes, this would be so much easier to teach and probably so much easier to learn if, if the currents in here are set up like this loop. And so the magnetic field is towards you and the electric field is up and down and that pattern continues on to this horn. This is my detector. So let me turn it on. Uh, it detects the energy and then I send it to this device so you guys can see it on camera. I've actually got a, a small detector right here, but I can also send it to a bigger one. If I turn it on, hopefully you'll see the needle go up, right? And so this is the microwave. Uh, maybe to convince you, I will turn it away and there it goes. See, it falls away because the microwaves are going over here towards the wall. They're not being collected by my detector. So this is the transmitter. This is the receiver. These are the microwaves in between. If I put my hand in between, you can see it drop because now it's being absorbed by my, my hand. This is be similar to be putting a, a burrito in your microwave oven. You, you put it in there, it starts to get warm. Now, they're not that powerful, so my hand's not getting warm. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Yeah, I can feel a little bit of warmth, but it's not going to cook my hand like it would in a, in a microwave oven. In, in fact, this is what makes this little contraption uh, kind of nice, uh, because as you can see, this has a uh, vertical metal pieces. And watch what happens to this detector. If I put it in this way, the detector drops to zero. If I put it in this way, the detector somewhat drops, but for the most part, it gets through. Why the difference? Well, remember, what are these? Electromagnetic waves. The reason we call them electromagnetic waves is what are they made out of? They are made out of electric and magnetic fields. <coughs> and we know that for metals, the electrons can conduct in the direction they're pushed if the field. So if you line up a piece of metal vertically and the electric field is vertically, uh, what's going to happen is when that electric field being vertical goes in here, it's going to be able to absorb it and the electrons move up and down. And so this piece of metal is getting warm because the electrons are moving up and down. But the way the metal is sliced when I hold it this way, the electrons really can't move that way. They, they try to move up, and yeah, there's a little bit of distance they can move, but for the most part, they can't move, and for the most part, then they can't absorb the energy, so the energy goes through it. And so the alignment is important, because how does this interact with the fields? These are electromagnetic waves. So watch, you, you, you see the same thing with this, this radio. If I turn this radio back on. Typically, a hub hospital has ICU capacity. And most of the and folks are small regional facilities without yeah. intensive care units. And they I have daily meetings hold it uh, between the like various this. hubs. Uh, and we coalesced into there a is a hub direction. Um, I should ask. Access. Can you hear it on the now lapel we're mic? Finding that okay. we're not so having so to there is a direction. Access. Watch what uh, happens some resources when I change uh, that are experiencing the direction of the radio. Shortages. Hospital beds to these more rural areas, right. or you're bringing people there to the more urban areas. Yeah. I'm having a hard time picking it up because of the alignment of my antenna with the field. Until 
and so it picks up better here and then we start to move patients and then of course it gets worse uh, it's an interesting system and you know the availability of beds is one thing right but you have to have human beings to right there is probably the worst and so there's an alignment of these and, and, and that, that's really the big piece. So I'll say it again. If I, if I overwhelmed you and took too much time doing the math, I apologize for that. But I do want you to see the concept of these waves. And so I'll say it again. The reason we call them electromagnetic waves is they are made up of electric and magnetic fields. And the direction of the electric and magnetic fields is that they are perpendicular. And the direction they travel is in a plane perpendicular or in a direction perpendicular to the plane that's made up of the electric and magnetic, uh, uh, the electromagnetic waves. And they travel at the speed of light. That was another one we, we threw in there. Well, I'll show you one more thing with these microwaves because many of you are probably very familiar with a microwave oven. And you probably have a door on the microwave oven. And so you can actually see the food cooking. And they usually made it out of something that looks like this. If you'll notice, it's not real clear like a, a window to your car. It's got a metal grid in. So if you haven't noticed, look at your microwave oven. You'll see a metal grid. And, and, and here's why. Uh, the metal grid has horizontal and vertical. So no matter how I align it, watch. The power drops. It doesn't get through. And it actually is reflecting it, if I were to get this to the other side and re reflect it. Um, well, I think I got it a little bit, oh, right there, something I got a little bit. I'm at a wire space there. But the metal grid is designed to reflect the microwaves back into it. But yet the light waves don't. And so, yet the light waves and the microwaves are each electromagnetic waves. They're at a different frequency. And so their behavior is very different. And the alignment is very different. And so that's why I'm glad your author kind of went through this section. He wants you to realize that what we call the electromagnetic spectrum then is this broad range of frequencies. Frequencies from zero and so way down here, which we call long wavelengths, to high, high, high frequencies. And of course, depending on what kind of technology we have, we can get these. Like for example, microwaves, we're pretty good with building electronic boxes that can go up to frequencies in the microwaves. Uh, sadly, we're not there yet to control infrared or visible light. Now, don't get me wrong, we still make light bulbs, uh, but what we basically do is we just send electricity through a uh, filament, get it hot, and let it bounce around at some frequency of about 10 to the 14th, 10 to the 15th, and then nature makes it for us, if you will. We, we don't really control the, the frequency. We don't control what direction the field is. We don't control what direction either of the fields, the electric or the magnetic. We just know nature will create it because we got it so hot that it's bouncing around up there. So we have kind of a crude way of making frequencies this high, even in the ultraviolets and the x-rays, very crude. And uh, we have a hard time even making any x-rays. Nature makes a lot of our, our x-rays. We know we're there and maybe someday we will make better waves here. Uh, now, let me show you another one here. Uh, this was actually what Hertz did first. Uh, he realized that there could be this whole spectrum and so he just built a receiver here. And he goes, let me just grab a receiver and of course, in his day, there were no other radio waves, so I'll just tune it to that same 1.2 uh, megahertz. I'll take off my uh, lapel mic, but as his first big experiment, or his buddy experiment, his name is Hertz, he goes, hey, let's give this a try. Let's see if we could actually then transmit it. So I'm going to just put my microphone here and hopefully you'll be able to hear this but Hertz realized 
that we don't have to have fancy electronic equipment to do this. What we can do is just kind of make a spark. What, 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 what Hertz realized is we could just make a, a spark and that spark would probably be made out of thousands and thousands of different frequencies. And all we need is one of those to be at what we're tuned for. <laughs> and then we would prove that they transmitted from one side of the lab to another. And so as you know, Hertz did this first and that's why we give him the honor of measuring frequency in terms of, of, of Hertz. But I, I hope you'll pick up the snap of the uh, spark here if I use the if I use the old Vandy graph here. And so it's not a very exciting experiment, I realize, but I, I just like to do it just because it's the history of what Hertz did first. He said, hey, let's just make a spark generator and transmit it. In fact, it's got some other really hint interesting history. Uh, it's tied to actually the sinking of the Titanic, believe it or not. The Titanic sank in uh, uh, 1912, 11, I won't say 12. Uh, and in those days, again, the electronics wasn't sophisticated enough to make a nice, clean, single frequency. And so what the radio operators would do is they would just make a spark and then amplify everything. Now, the bad thing about that is that really meant you're transmitting at every frequency. So anybody who had a receiver would pick up what you're transmitting. Now, that's fine if there's only one or two transmitters. And so that's how they did it at first. But by 1912, there were a lot of these spark transmitters out there. And sadly, because there were so many of them, somebody was always sending something. And so anybody using a receiver was like picking up just constantly garbage and not knowing if it's that for me or, or what was going on. And so when the Titanic sent out its SOS, uh, there was actually a ship within an hour's way. Remember, it took four hours for it to sink. But the radio operator could only hear garbled junk and said, I... I couldn't tell what was going on, and then they didn't know. And so the ship went on, and whatever, those thousands of people died, and we have the tragedy of the Titanic. And so a result after the sinking of the Titanic was to then introduce this worldwide United States. It's the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, and they regulate who gets what frequencies. And one of the first things they do is these spark ones, they're gone. You cannot broadcast frequency you want. You get a license for your frequency. Did we lose the sound? Oh, oh let me uh, see if I, I clipped it on right. How's the sound now? Okay. Okay. I think I, I, think I might have bumped the cord right here. I pushed it in. All right. Well, Wow, I've, I've been talking for quite a bit, and uh, I uh, apologize for that. So a quick, uh, quick uh, few more things, but I thought I would, before I left chapter, or before the, I left this last section, there's a couple of things that I still want to see in math I want to do for you. But right here at the visible, this might give you some insight to what your eyes are doing, because notice that the reds are a little lower in frequencies than the blue, and if you memorize the spectrum, Roy G. Biv, you'll see that what your eyes are really doing is your eyes are picking up these electromagnetic waves. And the difference between a green color and a blue color is the frequency. There's still these electromagnetic waves. Right? Remember, that was the beauty of, and I'll go back to this calculation, what got Maxwell real excited. Because Maxwell was trying to say that, look, 
I have shown that there are all this whole spectrum and a narrow part of that is what the human eye can detect. So the human eye is designed to pick up these electric and magnetic fields. Now they're in a range where what we call red is your brain saying this is at a low frequency, although couple hundred terahertz, I don't know if I'd call that a low frequency, but the red is at a lower frequency than the violet. And so what your eyes do is they pick up that frequency and communicate it with your brain by telling you, okay, this is a low frequency, let's call it red. This is a little higher frequency, it's right in the middle of what my eyes can detect, let's call it green. And this is a really high frequency, let's call it violet but they're all that same piece. Uh, that's why I thought I would get some sunlight into this room. And so if I prop this uh, door open, then I'm uh, missing our door stopper. I don't think that will quite stop it. Let me get something a little heavier here. Without people being on campus, we've kind of lost our uh, door stoppers. Uh, well, this chair's not very heavy, but I'll, I'll try it. <laughs> ah, good, I jammed it there. Okay, now I've got a mirror here, and so let me reflect some of the outdoor sunlight across the front here. We'll go onto the screen. Uh, good, all right. And let me go ahead and power down this display. Oh, it's oh well, bright light, okay. Uh, we need to make it a little, probably darker in here. Oh, I think that'll work. Um, because I have a prism here that if I put it in the path of the light and you look here, on the, the, the screen and I get it adjusted well. And maybe that's about the best I'm going to do. But I'm hoping you can kind of see the sunlight, which we call white light, is your brain telling you you're getting all the different frequencies. And you're getting the reds and the orange and the yellow and the green and the blue and the indigo and the, the violet. The whole, the whole visible uh, spectrum. Uh, it also is probably why, for those of you who might be wondering, uh, what is the next chapter? Now, I know we're coming to the end of the semester, so there's not a next chapter for this class. But the next chapter, chapter 35, which we do in Physics 123, is optics. Exactly. This discovery is the discovery of how electromagnetic waves are part of our, our optics. All right, let me go get the mirror and be right back. Bring the mirror back here and we'll... close that over there. Uh, let me turn the display back on because there's a couple of other little pieces here in this section 7 I want to make sure we, we cover. And now that we learn about these waves and hopefully I've shown a lot of the waves and hopefully you got that that picture here is let's look at some of the, the math again. Uh, if we remember things like, how about this equation? Distance equals velocity times time. Now, I know that's not part of this semester, but hopefully you haven't forgot it because I know you need it for a lot of the homework problems and probably will need it for the test. If I ask the question, like, how long would it take for the light to go from the sun to the earth? Or how long would it take for radio communication to go from the Earth to the Moon? 
or how long would it take radio communication to go from New York to London? You see, all of those would simply be distance, and here's the magical step. What is the speed? And that's what I want to emphasize in the math. What is the speed of any electromagnetic wave? Oh, I'm kind of in the way. What's the, what's the speed of all electromagnetic waves? 3 times 10 to the 8. So don't be fooled by some fancy question that says, hey, how long does it take for light to go from the moon to Earth? And then part B, how long does it take for radio waves to go from the moon to the Earth? It's the same number. In fact, it makes me think that the name speed of light is a bad term because it really should be the speed of electromagnetic waves. It's just because of history, we knew about light waves before, we didn't even know they were waves, but we could measure their speed, and we knew that before we knew about radio waves or microwaves. And so this section seven is trying to give you kind of a overall comprehension and actually reduce the science to they're all electromagnetic waves. They're all this fancy math that I probably spent too much time on, but I wanted you to see. So keep in mind, because I know there's a couple homework questions, and you know, and that's certainly in my library for uh, exam number three to give you a question about how far does it go. Are you, are you picking up my sound? Oh, okay. I wonder if it's the way I hooked it up real, real quick. Okay. Yeah, we'll keep a ear on the sound here. I don't want to lose the sound. <laughs> okay, and so that's one equation. Let, let's try this equation too. Watch this. Um, the standard symbol then for the speed of light is C. So don't be surprised if we use that quite a bit in the homework and on the solutions. We put in C for the uh, speed of light. But watch this. If I just, and I'll spell it out, speed, but remember I'm really talking about C, which is this distance divided by time. And I go back to a picture of these waves which I guess would be all the way back to section three. Your author is trying to show you uh, where does he have a good picture? I guess it's later on here. Okay. But it's this picture. I thought he had another one later on. Uh, but I'll use this one. But he's trying to say, and so here it is again, that there's an electric field and a magnetic field and they're perpendicular to each other. And then this pattern moves in a direction perpendicular to that. And it moves at this speed C. And if you had a simple sinusoidal pattern, then the distance to repeat itself would be called its wave length. And the traditional symbol is a lambda. So if we look at these waves and we let it travel for the distance of one wavelength, the time it takes is one period. And the reciprocal of the period is the frequency. And so another little piece of mathematics that I want to throw out here. Easy mathematics, it's not like this, this, this complicated one. So again, if you didn't quite get all this mathematics in terms of the vector calculus, get this mathematics. Now so again, it travels at the speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth, which is equal to one over the square root of mu naught over epsilon naught. And then, the wavelength times the frequency is their speed. And so this is the kind of a standard equation for the velocity of waves. 
that's why, if you let me go back to this chart, and so coming over here back to section 7, you'll see that your author was listing frequencies over here on the left hand side and wavelengths over here on the right hand side. Because once you know one of them, you know the other. Because remember, they all travel at the speed 3 times 10 to the 8. Uh, so a very common question on the homework and very one likely on the exam uh, would be something like this. Uh, this radio is tuned to a frequency of 1.2 megahertz. What is the wavelength of these radio waves? And so hopefully you can see that, okay, I just gave you the frequency and what you're supposed to know is that they travel at this speed, therefore you can divide by the frequency and get the wavelength. Uh, I could change the numbers but it's the same logic. I could come over to here and say alright I have a microwave transmitter. It transmits at 10 gigahertz. Oh what is its wavelength? Now yeah, fortunately that one's pretty easy to do right? That's just three centimeters because this would be uh, 10 giga would be 10 to the 10th and so you bring it over you get 3 times 10 to the minus 2 which is 3 centimeters. So these wavelengths if you could see them would be about this long. They'd be 3 centimeters. It would arc over and and come back and so they would be 10 gigahertz right here and you can kind of see 10 gigahertz actually it doesn't quite match 10 gigahertz, if I'm doing this right, should be about 3 centimeters and this looks like I'm below a centimeter. But other than maybe the graphics don't uh, line up, that's, w that's what it would calculate out to be, three, 3 centimeters. Okay, and so that's my waves. Now, oh, let's talk about uh, something else here. Uh, bummer, I have since uh, e erased it. But uh, maybe I will just clear this part of the board here. Uh, maybe I'll leave this simple math here because this is what I want you to get out of this discussion. That they travel at the speed of light. They're at right angles to each other. They travel at a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8th. Uh, what else? Uh, their wavelength and frequency are connected here. There's a connection between distance and time because of their uh, velocity. But there's also a connection between the electric field and the magnetic field. Uh, now I uh, lost it. I'm going to go back and find it. I noticed your author did it on the last page I was looking at. But if you remember the way we solved this equation, there was, and I think it was just above here, here we go, yeah just before here, uh, right there what your author calls number uh, 11 here, there was this equation that said the derivative of the electric field in place of x is equal to and it should be a time derivative. Is there a negative? Yeah, negative of the time derivative of the magnetic field. Now the reason I want to go back to that is I hope I got across to you that any electric field that followed this pattern would be a wave. And so one example would be to say this. Let's say the electric field had some maximum value and then followed the pattern sign and I will put uh, uh, x minus c t. Maybe I'll just do that. And I guess I don't need 
the extra set of parentheses. So let's just say that's the mathematical equation. Uh, notice it does fit this form, right? I have the x minus and the velocity. At this point, we didn't know that the velocity was going to come out to be the speed of light, but now that I know it, I'm going to, I'm going to put it that way. But watch this. If I take the uh, derivative of this, and so I would get e max, uh, the derivative of the sine is a minus cosine. I always got to get check my positives and, and, and negative. Let's see. So a negative cosine would be 0, 1. Yeah. OK. So that's the uh, derivative. That should equal minus the derivative of the magnetic field with respect to time. OK. Now I can get rid of the negatives. Uh, then I can take the uh, Magnet, the maximum uh, field electric, uh, then I have a cosine x minus ct, uh, then I can write that with the dt over here on the left hand side and the db over on the right hand side. I'll just change to full derivatives, I don't know why. Um, and then I will integrate and on the right hand side I get what I'm looking for. And what I'm getting out of this is if this is the electric field, what does the magnetic field look like? And so the magnetic field would then be equal and so I have to do a integral. And so this would be E maximum. Um, let's see, uh, the integral of a sine is a cosine uh, but the chain rule uh, should be a negative C. Um, and so I would have something that I guess looks like this. If this is the electric field, the magnetic field looks like minus E maximum over C sine x minus ct. And if we focus on this, this would be the maximum of the magnetic field. And that's what I wanted you to see. Remember I said Maxwell's equations are what we're trying to solve here. We're trying to solve, and I, I, I know I spent a lot of time doing it, hopefully not too long here, uh, but being that we're redoing it and got a chance to put on video, I go, I'm just going to take it kind of slow and do all the, all the pieces here. But, but this is saying then that not only can you have electromagnetic waves, not only do they travel at the speed of light, not only are they right angles to each other, not only is the wavelength times the frequency equal to the speed of light, not only is the speed of light times time equal to the distance, but there is a mathematical connection between the strength of the electric field and the strength of the magnetic field. And I, I don't think that's a surprise after we've done everything we've done for the last couple of hours. We know that the magnetic field makes the electric field and the electric field makes the magnetic field and so forth and so on. So they build on each other. One makes the other. So it's not a surprise that there's a mathematical connection. And this is the mathematical connection that I, I wanted you to, to see. What is that connection? And your author did that. Um, well, I guess he, he lists it here. And as he goes through and uh, does all this, this math, uh, you can see he has the wave equation for the electric field. He also does it for the magnetic field. He get, gets the speed of light. He then says, if this is the equation for the electric field, then this is the equation for the magnetic field. And he continues on, and he has, you know, well, here's a nice one too. Here's wavelength and frequency and the, and the speed. But the one I just did is right here that there is a relationship between the fields, and that relationship is equal to C. Now, I might even point out it's better than that. Uh, I put maximum. But the truth is, it changes with time, 
So at any moment, even if the electric field is not at its maximum, then of course we would have you know this number that would be less than one but we would have the corresponding number notice how sine goes with sine and so in terms of magnitude even if we're not talking about the maximum of the field this is the mathematical connection so if I were to come over to here and say okay what is over here the magnetic field when the electric field is say 7 volts per meter. So if I told you the electric field was 7 volts per meter, I'd go okay well so if electric field is 7 volts per meter if I divide that by the speed of light that would give me the strength of the magnetic field and so I would I would know that over here I have a electric field this way and a magnetic field that way as the flow of the wave goes this way and this is the connection mathematically between the two. Now, a lot of times we talk about the maximum because as it flows, eventually the maximum electric field will get to that spot and therefore the maximum magnetic field will get to that spot. They would both have that sine function to it. Now, let me give you a little hint for two of the homework problems that usually give students a, a hard uh, time. One of them is a question, I think you have two or even three of them on the homework that looks like this. Uh, they say, let's take a transmitting tower. And let's broadcast at some kind of power. Maybe 50,000 watts or something. And you go a distance away maybe a kilometer, two kilometers, a hundred kilometers. And you put up an antenna that has some length L. How much voltage would you get in that antenna? And so I'm using the magnetic antenna on this one. I didn't bother to put up the electric antenna. But a couple of your homework problems talk about the mag electric antenna. And so if I knew the electric field at this point, then I can just simply say, and of course I need to go all the way back to chapter 25, and say that the electric field times the size of the antenna is the voltage. And so for me to answer this question, I need to know, of course, what is the size of the antenna, but I also need to know the size of the electric field. And how do I get that? Well, there's two ways. Uh, the easiest way is what if they told me the magnetic field? <laughs> See, if they told me the magnetic field, I could just plug it into here and get the electric field. That's what the, the math is saying, that there's a mathematical connection between the electric and the magnetic field. Okay, that's the easy way. But what the last two sections are about, uh, the, uh, I skipped all the sections, sections four and five. How's that? Yeah. What if the battery's getting low? Yeah, maybe. Uh, I wonder if I. Uh, but we'll go quick here and wrap it up here. Is section uh, four is this connection? It's the connection between the energy in the wave and the electric field. And so let's work that out here. And that could then answer our question about what is the strength of the, of the field here. So give myself a little bit of room here to work this, this out. And uh, using what we just learned today plus all the other things we've learned in the past. Um, I would say something like this. 
if I had a wave and I will say my wave is traveling with the speed c to the, in the x direction. Uh, I'm trying to draw the electric field. Uh, I will try this my best, but I probably won't do it really well. What would the magnetic field look like? Well, this is the y direction and this is the x direction coming out of the board is the z direction. And so I would have a magnetic field that is supposed to be <laughs> coming out this way. I told you my drawing wouldn't look uh, that good. But the three dimensions here with the Y going up and the B coming out and then traveling along in that direction. If I just said how much energy is in there, my first thoughts would be to go way, way back to our capacitors. And, and so when we did our capacitors, um, we did this energy density. Now, I don't know if you remember, uh, we called it U sub E, and we said it's one half epsilon naught E squared. And that was the energy density stored inside of our capacitors. We also had this for the magnetic field which we did when we first introduced the magnetic field and I think the inductor, so I think that goes into chapter 32, where we had the magnetic field squared over 2 mu naught. This is the energy density of the magnetic field. Uh, and so here's what I'm getting at is for me to understand how much energy, and then of course eventually what the electric field is, which eventually then is the voltage in my receiving antenna, is I've got to consider both fields. And so I'm going to say that the energy density total, some of it is electrical and some of it is magnetic. And so the electrical part would be one half mu naught E squared. And the magnetic part would be B squared over two mu naught. Now, remember what I said a few moments ago. These electromagnetic waves are connected together in space and in time one creates the other and so there is not only a uh, connection to them in terms of their position and their speed and their derivative but there's a connection to their size. So I'm going to take advantage of that because one of the questions I might have immediately is more energy in the form of electric or is more energy in the form of magnetic? So let's see. So right here I'm going to put the magnetic field and write it as electric field over C squared. I'm going to take advantage and I don't think it's on the board anymore, but the C squared, and maybe it's worth repeating over here, remember the speed of these electromagnetic waves was calculated as 1 over the square root of mu naught over epsilon naught. So I'm going to take advantage of that and take the reciprocal of C squared and write it as mu naught over epsilon naught. And so the mu naught is going to cancel. And this is going to be a one half mu naught 
I'm sorry, epsilon naught, electric field squared. And the magnetic one, when I write it this way, actually is exactly the same form. And so what this tells me is that the amount of energy in these waves that is made out of electrical energy is the same as the magnetic. And so my first question about which one had more energy, I guess I've answered it, and the other have more energy. They're exactly the same. Oh, the light's pretty low. Um, I didn't bring one out here, but remember when this thing fell apart. Wonder what would happen. Okay. Quickly changed out this battery, although I don't know how good. Can you hear me any better? Yeah? Okay. All right, we'll do that real quick, and hopefully that'll get us through. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, talking way too much here, but I, I just thought it would be good to make a nice, cleaner one. The other one was just so quick. Uh, but I'll say it again, that then what we have here is these two are exactly the same, and so I can answer that question about which one has more energy. Neither. They have exactly the same amount of energy. Uh, now... Maybe I'll take this one more step and say, all right, what is their average energy? Uh, the reason I say that is because remember this picture I'm trying to get across to you. I'll come back over here to my transmitter. Uh, my transmitter would have a magnetic field this way and an electric field this way, and it would be moving along. And if we write it as a sine function, the electric field would build up to a maximum, then go to zero, then go to a maximum negative, then go to zero, then go to a maximum positive, go to zero, then a maximum negative. And so as the energy is coming to me, since it's in the form of electrical energy and magnetic energy, and that depends on the strength of the field, it is kind of going bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller. And... Because of that, I'm going to take advantage of chapter 33, where we did our AC circuits and we did average power. Remember we said, when you, if you put in the RMS value, you will get the power. So I can get the average power by putting in the RMS value of the field. And since they're identical, I can add them together. Now also, if you'll let me do one more thing from chapter 33, we learned that the RMS value is the maximum value divided by the square root of 2, at least for a sinusoidal function. And so if I square that, I get 1 half mu naught e maximum squared. And so this is the average, oops, I didn't mean to put electrical, I meant total. This is the average total, because this includes, and this is what I wanted to warn you about, is this equation actually includes the magnetic part. It doesn't look like it because we only have electrical in here, but remember, we converted our electrical energy uh, not into magnetic, I don't want to say that, I want to say mathematically into a different looking term that has electrical in it and then we combined it right here and then we switched it to maximum. All right. Now, why did I do all that? Well, remember, I'm trying to answer this question here about, okay, what would be the voltage in my receiving antenna that is a bunch of kilometers away? 
And now you're beginning to see that there is a mathematical connection between the strength of the electric field. See, that's what I need to know over here, right? I need to know the strength of the electric field um, and the length of the antenna. If I multiply those two together, I'm going to get the voltage in my, my antenna. And so there is a connection. Now let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, that, of course, is the energy uh, density. And uh, what I like to do here is to say, all right, do you remember the word power? Uh, power is the energy per time. Now this goes back to physics 121. And so if we talk about the power of it, that's where this comes into play. This is the power being given off by our transmitter. However, that power goes off in a three-dimensional sphere. And so the transmitter sends some of its energy this way and some of it that way. And so by the time it gets to my receiver, so let's say that here is my receiver, I'm really not interested in the power over the whole sphere. I'm only interested in the power that gets within the area of my receiver. That's the amount I get. And that is called intensity. So if I take the power and I divide it by the area and I give you a new word called the intensity in, in intensity. And I say, okay, let's give you then this in intensity. Uh, this is equal to what? Oh, I don't want to erase that. I want to leave that picture there. Uh, let me jump down here. So let me leave this as the symbol I here for a second. And let me put power as energy over time and then include area. Uh, let me multiply by length over length. Let me group this together and pause. This is energy per volume. It's the whole reason I did this. This is the energy density, although this is the average. So I could write this as the average intensity is then equal to the average total energy density. And the other two, length per time, is their speed. And that answers this question. See, because if I come back to this piece of the puzzle, I might do something like this. I might say, all right, what's the intensity of my electromagnetic wave at my receiving antenna? Well, the intensity is power divided by time. I mean, sorry, but area. So I will say power. And so in the problem, they might say, this is 50,000 watts being broadcast. The area would be 4 pi r squared. Why 4 pi r squared? Okay. Remember, this is broadcasting. So if I have an antenna up here, the energy goes out equally in all directions. That energy is spread out over a sphere. And so as it gets further and further and further out, as the radius of this sphere gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you can see that according to this equation, the intensity goes lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. The power remains the same. It's still 50,000 watts. It's just now 50,000 watts spread out over a bigger area. 
And then of course this side of the equation is the average energy density. So this would be one half uh, mu naught times the electric field uh, maximum squared times C. And it is this right here that I would use to get this. See, because they told me, what's the power? 50,000 watts. How far away am I? 10 kilometers. That would give me the intensity. If I put all these other factors in, that would tell me the electric field, or at least that would tell me the maximum electric field. And then if I multiplied that by the length of the antenna, I would then get the maximum voltage. So all of these equations are algebraic equations, but what's actually, I think, pretty hard is that they are um, the result of a lot of steps to get there. So I hope I didn't uh, overwhelm you. Um, I think it's probably a good time to stop. I was planning to go to the next section which talks about the momentum that these waves have. But uh, since I've talked for quite a while, I don't want to overwhelm you, and uh, we'll just call it good. So the next section five and the next section six, know that uh, we won't have any of that on the exam. Um, might be nice to look it over, if nothing else. Uh, I should tell you that it's kind of surprising that these waves have momentum. Um, and half of me wants to show you in the math that it does, but I'm going to cut it here just because uh, I think I've been talking for almost three hours here. So we'll, uh, we'll call it good, and that'll be enough just to get through the rest of the semester and makes a, a good ending to the semester. All right, see you later.